against the familiar scientific dialectic of putting up a theory, testing it against the world, seeing that it doesn't fit, going back and changing the theory, and it goes back and forth, and then we start to make progress. That was a picture that captured me, especially because I'd grown up as an undergraduate uh, uh, hoping to be a scientist. It turned out I didn't have to give that ambition up after all. I could do it in a philosophy department. Or as you said it to me the other day, slowly learning how not to be fooled by appearances one thing at a time. That oh. is how science proceeds, yes. Yeah. So now, you were at Oxford, you apparently um, um, went, uh, went, went on a retrieval mission, is this right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true. Um, by this time, Pat was two years behind me. Um, uh, we were writing letters back and forth across the Atlantic. I don't think we should go into I too much think, detail. I uh, think not too much detail <laughs> here. No, very but well. we, we do have copies of the letters, uh, if you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went and visited Oxford uh, two summers in a row. Uh, this was when I was writing my dissertation for Pittsburgh and she was writing hers for Oxford. And uh, it was a case of two heads being uh, four times better than one. And uh, so I had two beautiful summers uh, in Oxford, um, chasing around after Pat. And, uh, we and the English countryside. And uh, well, Oxford itself was perfectly wonderful, but we did, of course, uh, trot out to the countryside. Uh, we were both very young. It was idyllic. It was. Uh, we remember those years with mm. great mm. fondness. And we made friends there uh, in Oxford that have lasted the 40 or 45 years since, just as we made uh, long-lasting friends in Pittsburgh. Uh, they've been intellectual friends, uh, interlocutors for uh, for a long time. It's so altogether very fortunate. We were lucky. As so. And then back to uh, back to Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, to begin teaching. Yes, yes uh, I think had the Vietnam War not been in full sway in uh, 1969, um, mm -hmm. I think we might have come to America. But as it was. It were the, the the times were very uncertain, very troubled, and we really felt that we had better stay in Canada. And um, Paul at that time actually had a nice job, a tenure track job in Toronto. And I, because there were uh, several universities in Toronto, I sort of assumed that I'd probably get a job there too. But it, that didn't work out, and um, partly because one department the, at, at York University said, don't even bother applying because we do not hire women. We do not think they should be in the profession. And so, you know, you're a very nice person, but we would never hire you. You mean because you can't so, think? Well, this was 1969. It's not that long ago. And, it's, and I often tell my female students that story because it's not that long ago. And mm -hmm. these were very, you know, basically decent people. I mean, they weren't thugs who were running about, you know, assaulting people. Uh, and this was simply their view. In any case, so as it happened, there were positions in the University of Manitoba, and Paul and I went there, and this was to Winnipeg. Right. To where you taught for a number of years. Fourteen years. Started a family, two children. And went to medical school. Right. Those two children who are now both... Neuroscientists. Neuroscientists. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Which we'll get back to in a moment. Uh, and your grandparents now. Yes. Yes, happily so. Yes. Small neuroscientist. <laughs> or neurophilosopher. We'll, yeah. we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so you, um, you're back in Canada, but at some point there's this interest develops in neuroscience. And I know from my exponing, own experience of doing television programs about the brain that uh, even if you show people a brain, they're sort of don't even like the look of it, the thought that it's actually in their heads is, seems to be somehow repugnant. <laughs> People seem to think that a lot of these things that we do, like free will consciousness, must come from some, some other agency and not this three, three pounds of meat. Um, so how did, the, how did the brain enter your life? Well, I, I've remarked already on the, the influence of Quine and the movement towards the looking at the empirical data. And it, it just seemed to me very obvious that 
how we think and feel and reason is not something done by the non-physical soul. I don't think there is such a thing. So it must be done by the brain. So we need to know how the brain does these things. And, you know, having grown up on a farm, I, one of the jobs, of course, is to kill the chickens and then to clean the chickens. And I learned a lot about physiology, or at least a lot about anatomy, by cleaning chickens. And, you know, after a while, I mean, it has a bad smell, so you just kind of get beyond that. But it's really quite wonderful. And so, uh, when you see, for example, a series of eggs from almost completely formed to slightly less formed with very soft shells to softer shells to tinier and tinier, and you realize that you're looking at an egg, a series of eggs being formed and about to be laid. It's a very beautiful thing. So. It was with great excitement that um, I went to the medical school at the University of Manitoba and the anatomy department was very happy to have me come. And actually I did have a human brain that was mine to dissect. And probably like you, you, you know, the first encounter with this brain, I just felt tremendous awe um, that this sort of gray, uninspiring looking thing was what made somebody the person they were. Mm. It was very exciting. has the consistency of tofu as well. Yeah. The consistency isn't what matters. <laughs> <laughs> what the, matters is, is what the it does. The connectivity. And, uh, yeah. we, we were uh, lucky in uh, a further respect uh, about this time after we'd been at Manitoba for six or seven years and started the family. We had a fortunate sabbatical uh, which we spent in Vancouver, and there was a visiting neurosurgeon. This is um, uh, Joe Bogan? Oh yeah, Joe. Uh, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Um, who was who what? The split brain. Uh, uh, yeah, that's Joe exactly did the right. Split brain this was surgeries. when the split brain uh, uh, research was um, hitting the the newspapers and the magazines full bore, and he was giving a talk across town at uh, uh, Simon Fraser University, and Pat said, "Paul, we got to go to this." So we did go, and it was indeed very, very gripping. And at that point, I was working on my my very first book, mm -hmm. uh, which was defending materialism, but. At at that time, neither of us knew very much about the brain, but we came back after that year in Vancouver with a real enthusiasm, and that's when Pat said, I'm going down to the medical school and see what I can't get hooked up with. And it was a, sort of a new life for her. I remember it really rekindled her enthusiasm for um, things philosophical because the data from the neurosciences was starting to flow. The um, new instruments were now available to everybody, and Microprobes with uh, uh, putting electrodes into single cells and doing recordings. Um, there were uh, uh, CAT scans were now uh, coming online. We were starting to learn about the brain, that is to say, the neuroscientific profession was, uh, and pouring information out that uh, addressed questions that we'd long had. So, if you like, we got lucky. We're out there on surfboards, and a big wave came by just at the right time. Uh, we caught it, and we've been riding it ever since. It did, uh, uh, in a way, we were fortunate to be at the University of Manitoba. Once again, it was the freedom that it afforded yeah, us. Yeah. We, uh, uh, we weren't at, at Harvard with some bank of gray beards looking down at us, telling us what we had to do. Uh, and we were in a philosophy department. We could sort of switch over to neuroscience. Pat went to work in Larry Jordan's lab. He was uh, concerned with the motor system rather than the perceptual system, which we would have chosen. But beggars can't be choosers. And we were delighted that he let first Pat into the lab for a year. After a while, I began to feel left out, so uh, he let me in, and we both participated in his wonderful Wednesday night experiments uh, where we would uh, try and figure out how it is that the cat uh, spinal cord allows the cat to walk. Uh, what's the actual mechanism? Uh, Larry also had bigger budgets than philosophers usually have, so he was able to get a computer into the lab. This would have been in, what, 77? Mm -hmm. uh, the very early stages. So that introduced us to computers, and uh, I got caught up in modeling then. Um, 
about that time we had an opportunity to to start to move to other universities and bless this institution 